I've got a new joke. Um, please stop me if you've heard it. So four brothers left home for college, and they became very successful in their different fields of endeavor. And some years later, they chatted after Christmas, discussing what they had purchased their mother for Christmas, and she could be difficult. She was a cantankerous woman, their mother. And so they went over the top in their Christmas gifts. One said, I had a house built for Mama. The other said, I had a $100,000 stereo installed and movie theater installed in her house. The other said, I had a Mercedes dealer deliver a brand new Mercedes to her. The fourth said, you know how mama loves to read the Bible, but she, she's losing her, her eyesight. So I've, I've found this parrot uh, that we trained, memorized the whole Bible, and now all Mama has to do is sit near that parrot. It cost me $200,000, but I had it done, and she now has that parrot. After the holidays, Mom sent out her thank you notes. She wrote, Milton, the house you sent is so huge, I live in only one room, and I have to clean the whole thing. Thanks anyway. <laughs> Marvin, I'm too old to travel. I uh, have my groceries delivered. I'll never use that Mercedes, but the thought was good. Thanks anyway. Uh, Michael, you gave me an expensive movie theater. It can hold 50 people, but all my friends are dead. <laughs> I've lost my hearing and I'm nearly blind. I'll never use it. Thanks for the gesture. And then, dearest Bob, you were the only son to have the good sense to give a little thought to your gift. That chicken was delicious. <laughs> At least it was a Christian chicken. <laughs> At least that's what Sam told me in between services. You purchased at Chick-fil-A, perhaps? <laughs> We're on our next to last lesson in our series based on the life of Jacob. You'll recognize the name Jacob as an Old Testament character. He is what we call a patriarch, one of the leaders in the family of God, which is so surprising when you read the story of Jacob. The story of Jacob is difficult to read because he messed up so. But the story of Jacob is a delight to read because we mess up so. And the story of Jacob, I think, is in the Bible to reveal not the success of Jacob, but the faithfulness of God, because God was faithful. And Jacob discovered and relied upon a great and wonderful grace and we are doing the very same. We're 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. We find ourselves back in Israel, the covenant land. Uh, Jacob has already followed or tried to escape his, Esau, his brother Esau's wrath by fleeing up into modern-day Turkey, and now he's made that 500-mile journey back. Last week, Travis did a great job of describing how Jacob stopped too short of Bethel, and atrocities happened in a village called Shechem. And now we pick up the story in the next chapter, chapter 35. Why don't we pray, and then we'll get right to work. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the great and matchless grace that sustains us, that blesses us, that empowers us, that fuels us. We bless you. We need to ask you to have mercy on our teacher. His sins are many. And help us to see Jesus, just Jesus. Through Christ we pray. And all God's people said. Amen. Well, buried like a grass burr in the final chapter of the Garden of Matthew's Gospel is this interesting verse. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them still doubted. This is the final interaction the disciples have with Jesus. Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. The disciples have spent three years with Jesus. This is the final chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And in the final moments that they have with Jesus, Matthew has to confess, well, there was still some doubt among us. Do you not find that extraordinary? For three years, they've been with Christ. 
For three years, no one knew Jesus better than they. They had spent three years with him, and then after the resurrection, they spent 40 days with him. They had seen him vacate tombs. They had seen him dictate weather patterns. But still they doubted. Ask, ask them a question about Christ. Go ahead. Ask them anything. They spent three years. Does he snore? Does he hum when he walks? Does he talk to storms in his sleep? If so, do the storms listen? They would know anything. They have spent three years in the, near the person of Christ. And my, how they could describe the passion of Christ. Some of them were present when Christ was falsely accused and sentenced to death. John was present when the nails pounded into the hands and feet of Christ. They were present. They could tell you about the passion of Christ. When it came time to bury the body, they were there. When it came time to go and look for the body, they saw the empty tomb. Why, Peter ran a finger down the stone slab. Thomas examined the hands of Christ like a palm reader. For 40 days, Jesus taught them. 40 days in a resurrected body. Can you imagine a six-week seminar with the mind that created microbes? They were hand-trained by Christ. They were hand-picked by Christ. They were witnesses to the hinge moments of history that we still discuss to this day. They saw things no one else had ever seen. These folks were ready, right? But some of them still doubt it. What in the world is Jesus going to do with these guys? We ask not just for their sake, but for ours. Because some of us still struggle. Some of us still doubt. Some of us still battle the same battles we've battled all of our lives. I still worry. I still gossip. I'm still torn between the AA meeting and the corner bar. Permafrost still chills my marriage. I still look twice where I should never look once. I still clench my teeth and want to whack that speck of dandruff ex-husband of mine. We still struggle. Consequently, at least I, I may not be speaking for you, but many of us still find comfort in this distillery. Did you see what I just did? Distillery of doubt and struggle. Does God have a place? Does God have a place for those of us who still struggle? I think the story of Jacob is in the Bible to help us answer that question. And no one needed the assurance of Jacob more, no, no one needed the assurance more than Jacob did. As Travis did a terrific job pointing out last week, Shechem was a toxic wasteland. A year in the life of Jacob in which he was in a spiritual drought, he forgot who God was. He forgot what God commanded. God had given him only one instruction, and that was go back to Bethel. Go back to that place where you saw the stairway to heaven and you heard my promises. Go back to Bethel. But Jacob stopped short of obedience. He stopped short. And he stopped and pitched his tent in the shadow of Shechem. And his interrupted loyalty resulted in devastation, a devastated family, rape, carnage, sacrilege. Chapter 34 is without a doubt the darkest chapter in the Jacob story. God is not mentioned in any of the 31 verses. Not one time. And it's not that God was not present. It's simply that, that God was not sought 
Jacob once again lived life by his old terms, and he, and he paid a high price for doing so. Surely God is done with Jacob at this point. I mean, he gave Jacob so much, but Jacob gave so little in return. God made covenants, and then Jacob broke covenants. God reached out, but Jacob stopped short. God certainly has had his fill of Jacob, right? But then we move from the dark chapter 34 to the powerful surprise of chapter 35 in verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. God spoke to Jacob. God appeared to Jacob. God came to Jacob. God took the initiative. God intervened. Jacob was still in the shadow of Shechem. Blood was still in the fingernails of his sons. The stench of death was still in the air. Jacob and his sons had behaved like the pagans who surrounded them. Yet God came to Jacob. And whereas the name of God is not at all mentioned in chapter 34, his name is mentioned, at least by my counting, 11 times in the first 14 verses of chapter 35. It's as if God moved into Jacob's story and set up camp. He told Jacob to move to Bethel, and finally Jacob came to his senses. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress, who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. And then they set out, and the terror of God fell on the towns and all around them so that no one pursued them. Finally, Jacob... Behaving like a patriarch you were called to be, he reassumed the role of leader in the clan, leader of the family. He cleaned out the old. He made a clean break with the past. There would be no more false gods, no more flirting with Shechem, no more vacillating and waffling between convictions. Jacob came to his senses and resumed the journey home. But please be clear, the hero of this story is not Jacob. The hero is God. It was God who prompted Jacob, not Jacob who sought God. It was God who moved Jacob, not Jacob who moved God. It was God who stepped in, not Jacob who looked up. Yeah, Jacob repented, but only after God called out his name. Can I give you the word for this? Grace. Grace. God had grace on Jacob. Grace is God on the move. Grace is God prompting, God moving, God redeeming, God renewing. And God not only stirred Jacob, but God appeared to him again and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you'll no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will be among your descendants. The land I give to Abraham and Isaac I will also give to you, and I will give this land to your descendants after you. God reaffirmed every promise he had made to Jacob in Jacob's lifetime. And he reaffirmed Jacob's new name. God had every reason to give up on Jacob and start over with a plan B, but Jacob God never forgot Jacob. And the one who promised a blessing, blessed him and kept his promise. And once again, Jacob was confirmed to be Israel. Again, the word for this, grace. All grace. Could you use some? And could you use a reminder 
of the life-changing power of God's aggressive and wonderful grace. We all could. We all could. The Christian life is not difficult. It's impossible. The Christian life is not difficult. It's impossible. Find it hard to agree? Well, consider these Everest-level commands found in Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. See how you score, just four commands. Whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. How are you doing on that one? Here's one. Whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Gentlemen, you want to raise your hand? No, you don't, do you? <laughs> Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Mm -hmm. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Those, just four. And how are we doing? Well, we're not doing that great. We're not doing that great. We read commands like that and we say, how can we do it? It's not within me. I don't have the power. I fall short too often. I'm like Jacob. I'm like Jacob. I end up where I'm not supposed to be. I think that's why we cherish the story of Jacob. You see, Jacob is the story of every person. Joseph and Daniel, well, they're the blue bloods in the Scripture. The Apostle John and Mother Mary, they're sages, they're mystics. The Apostle Paul, he's the patron saint of theologians and philosophers. But Jacob, every day seemed to find a new way for him to wander off course. He just couldn't get back on track. He had a little bit of Charlie Brown in him. Do you remember Charlie Brown? Have you ever seen the way Lucy described Charlie Brown. You, Charlie Brown, are a foul ball in the line drive of life. You're in the shadow of your own goalposts. You're a miscue. You are three putts on the 18th green. You are a 7-10 split in the 10th frame. You are a dropped rod and reel in the lake of life. You are a missed free throw, a shanked nine iron, and a called third strike. Boy, don't pull any punches, Lucy. You ever feel like Charlie Brown? Beaten up, kicked down, till we're sure we've earned it. And he wondered, Jacob wondered, what we've wondered. Does God still have a place for a person like me? If that's your question. Oh, boy, I'm so excited to share with you some promises that you can ponder like this one from Romans chapter 5 and verse 20. Though sin is shown to be wide and deep, thank God his grace is wider and deeper still. Amen. In full view of the entire creation, you were, by God's grace, redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You are deemed worthy of his creation. You're loved eternally in heaven. The redemption is complete. No more chasing after God. No more racing after significance because you have both. And you cannot out God's grace. You simply can not. Later in his life, a Swiss theologian by the name of Karl Barth made a trip to the United States, considered by many to be the greatest theologian of his generation. Auditoriums were packed when he came to lecture. And after each lecture, he would entertain questions. And according to the story, after one of the lectures, a student asked him a question, Professor Bart, what's the greatest thought that you have ever had? And the old gentleman paused and pondered and then responded, the greatest thought, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. 
Is anything greater than that? To truly believe, not just here in the head, but deep in the heart, that Jesus loves me. In spite of all I've done, Jesus loves me. In spite of everywhere I've gone, Jesus loves me. In spite of all those times that I fell short, Jesus loves me. Again, the word for this, grace, wild, pursuing, passionate grace. Grace that leads us to scriptures like this one. He predestined us to be adopted by himself as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, such being his gracious will and pleasure. In other words, he did it because he wanted to. God loved Jacob because God chose to love Jacob, not because Jacob was worthy of God's love. That's grace. He moved you into his family. He changed your name, your address. He gave you a seat at the dinner table. You are accepted. You're accepted in the beloved, in the kingdom of God. You are accepted. Many years ago, I built a sermon around this little phrase, accepted in the beloved. And after the lesson, I was greeting people out in the foyer. And a young lady came up to me whom I knew very well. She had had such a hard and troubled life. But that day, she looked happy. She was smiling. I said, what's going on? She said, I learned something. I said, what? She said, I'm not an exception to the acceptance. I'm not an exception to the acceptance. We often think we are. We often think, oh, God's love is a great story for everybody but me. God's grace is great for everybody who hasn't done what I've done. God includes every person except people who have taken the path that I took. But scriptures like this remind us that we are not an exception to God's acceptance. So, hey, no more self-elimination. Okay? No more self-condemnation. No more self-accusation. Isn't it time for you to receive what God so longs you to receive, and that is grace. You are one with him, and he is one with you. According to the Bible, you're complete. Complete. You are his righteousness. You are holy and blameless and beyond reproach. You are perfected. For all time, grace. It's what Jacob discovered. A God who had made a covenant with him. And once God makes a covenant, he'll never break it. I'm talking to somebody who's striving for perfection. No need, you're already perfect. I'm talking to somebody who's yearning to impress God. Hey, he's impressed. I'm talking to somebody who's longing to win God's favor. You already have it, but you did not win it. He blessed you with it, and he will lift from you the burdens that you've been carrying for all these years, the burdens of guilt and regret. Some months ago, Dean Lynn, who keeps our grandchildren one day a week and I were enjoying a delightful conversation with the mother of our grandchildren in the kitchen. Our two grandchildren, Rose and Max, don't you love that name of that little boy, (laughs) had spent the afternoon doing what they love to do. They love to look for rocks on our property. Uh, tell Deanlin, you don't have to buy them Christmas toys. Just give them rocks. They love rocks, shiny rocks, glittery rocks. And so they'll disappear out behind our house and, and come back with a sack of rocks. And we were talking with Jenna in the kitchen when all of a sudden we heard this voice, 911, 911. We recognized the voice. It was Rose, six-year-old Rose. She burst in the back door saying, 911. I don't know where she picked that up. <clears throat> we said, What's wrong? She said, Max is stuck. He can't get up. Well, we ran out the back door. I immediately assumed 
the worst. I thought, oh, he's fallen in a ravine, maybe even a snake bite. Who knows what's happened? We have a blacktop road that leads up to our house, and there we spotted Max off in the distance. And, and Jenna, Rose's mom, said, what happened? She said, he put so many rocks in his pockets that his pants fell down. <laughs> and he can't get up. <laughs> I laughed. Jenna laughed. Deanlin turned to me and said, here comes a good sermon illustration. <laughs> and I, boy, she right. This one's a doozy. As we got closer to Max, we could see he was there on the blacktop road. And the only thing separating his bottom from the asphalt was his Spider-Man underwear. <laughs> he was squatted down and his pants were at his ankles. I said, Max, can you stand up? And he stood up and his pants stayed down. And sure enough, he had rocks in the front pocket, rocks in the front pocket, rocks in the back pocket, rocks in the back pocket, and his pants had just fallen to the ground. And he was stuck. He couldn't move. I said, Max, do you want some help? Yes. Do you want me to help you get the rocks out of your pants? Yes. And so we ran over and took all the rocks out of the pants and he hitched them up and off he went again. I think our failures are kind of like those rocks. They keep us from moving forward. They're weights in our lives that keep us from making progress. We respond a bit differently than little Max did. Your heavenly father comes to you. Your heavenly father comes to me and says, would you like some help? And there are some times in which we say, you know, I don't deserve it. I'm such a bum. I'm such a failure. I am an acceptant, exception to the acceptance. Or there are times when we say, would you like, God says, would you like to, me to help you deal with that guilt? And we say, hmm, just make me up a batch of martinis, please. Or sometimes we get defiant. Oh, I didn't really make any mistakes. I'm not that bad of a person. Max shows us how to handle our failures. He just said yes. Yes. And let his papa pull the rocks out of his pockets. Would you let God pull the rocks out of your pockets? Am I talking to anybody who still feels defined by mistakes you made decades ago? Am I talking to anybody who's living with the shame that you have as a result of what you did 24 hours ago? Could I talk to both of you and say, it's not God's will that you live weighed down with yesterday's failures. If it wasn't for Jacob. It's not for you. It's not for me. Do you know this promise from the book of Psalms? For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions, taken our wrongs from us God has done it would you let him lift that weight from you yeah we love Jacob because Jacob is so much like we are Jacob finally made it back to Bethel he finally made it back to that place where he had seen the ladder to heaven he finally made it back to that place where God had appeared to him. And I wonder how long he was in the area before he went on a search for that altar that he had erected to God the night that God made an appearance to him. Did he go looking for that stone, that very stone that he had turned into a pillow? And did he receive once again the promise from heaven that Jacob, you'll be Israel, and through you shall come the greatest gifts that will bless generations namely Jesus Christ the greatest gift of grace 
Jacob did become the father of nations, but not because of his performance, but because of God's faithfulness. Amen. Lord, now as, as we receive your word, we pray you can go deep. Uh, Lord, I'm asking you to go deeper th than, it, than it's ever gone before. And that, 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 that vestige of guilt, that lingering fester of fa failure, would you please, Lord God, bring healing today. Today, miraculously, spiritually, emotionally, go deep, deep within us. You have taken our sins and you have removed them. And we are now free to move forward in faith because of your grace. In the name of Jesus, we pray.